am Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Beverly Hills View. Our guests are actor Steve Spiro and director Anne Bronston. Both are connected to the play at the Zephyr Theater called UK Underdog. Writer-producer Steve Spiro was born and raised in London, to be exact, Whitechapel. He went to high school and college in Essex. He's been on the stage and in films, and he's written several screenplays, one of which chronicles the life of fighter Sam Langford. He's currently starring in the play he wrote based on true facts, and it's called UK Underdog. Steve is a member of the Pacific Resident Theater, and welcome. Hi there. Actress, writer, director, Anne Bronston was born and raised in New York City, went to Performing Arts High School in Manhattan and Hamilton College in upstate New York. She's a member of the Rogue Machine Theater, the Pacific Resident <laughs> Theater, and the City Garage. She's directed several great plays, including Donald Margulies' Dinner with Friends, which I loved, uh, Martin McDonald's Beauty Queen of Lean Ann, which I could take or leave, and Tennessee Williams' Baby Doll. Her numerous short stories have been published and are award winners. So when did you start directing, Anne? Very recently, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. So you've been acting up until this time? Yeah, uh, about three or four years ago, uh, a friend asked me to direct her, and that was in Beauty Queen. Oh. And I said, sure. Did and you know Beauty Queen? Did you know no, the writing? No. Oh, so you had to really break it down. I should have, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> uh, no, I, it just felt really fun and natural and much more relaxing than acting. Really? Oh, because someone else was doing the work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> someone else does all the work. The right. lights, the set. You just sit there and go, mm. Move this <laughs> way, move that. <laughs> when you went to Hamilton, what did you study? Um, I said I went to Hamilton, but I dropped out after two years. And I studied theater and history. And oh, you did study theater. So you had planned, did you plan to be an actress? Uh, yes. High School of Performing Arts and also, yeah, it was. So important. you talked about directing and how easy, let's say, but do you think it was because you have an acting background? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. What's I mean, be yeah, because I've, I've been around the theater so much, and, you know, the more you know about acting, and, you know, acting is the essence of the play, and, yeah. So what, what special traits do you think a director should have? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, that's an interesting question um, because there's so many traits that it's hard to prioritize and basically, you know, the trait that I think I bring to it is I'm a really good audience member. So when I'm watching... So listening? Yeah, so when I'm watching, I'm thinking, why am I not paying attention right now? How, you know... Interesting. I just, yeah, so... And do you think, and that applies probably to everything that you've directed, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it, and also, I think, also because I write, I have a good sense of making the story um, very accessible. So the plays that we mentioned are all so different, really. Um, Dinner with Friends compared to Beauty Queen. So how do you go about, um, and Baby Doll, totally, Tennessee Williams, totally different. How do you go about breaking down these things? Well, uh, first of all, you know, PRT has this wonderful space called the co-op, and it's a place where the actors can produce what they want to be in. Even if, you know, they're, you know, if you're 80 years old and you want to do Juliet, do it in the co-op. Oh, you know, I see. it's a very free space, and all these plays were brought to me. Some actor wanted to do it. Oh, and I, I was see. like, sure, sure. So do you collaborate? with the actor before you start and no they no? just say you know this is our date and would you direct this play and then I say sure so you belong to three yeah. theater companies yeah. I mean isn't that a lot <coughs> and do they all focus on different things or what happens yeah they're, they're all very different actually city Gar city garage is very um, political theater and very um. yeah a and um, sort of agiprop theater, and Rogue is very new plays, and PRT is very much 
older plays, oh. classics. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. And so do you act or direct or write for all three, or what do you do? Um, mostly I act for them, and now I'm starting to direct. And Steve, you belong to Pacific Residence, so yes. have you performed with them? Yes, I've been with them for about 14 or 15 years. Oh, you have? <coughs> yeah. So, so have they done your work before? Or? I, um, I've done a bunch of plays with them. We did the, the last one I did there was The Homecoming by Harold Pinter. That uh, did very well. It was a really, really good production. But anything that you wrote? This oh, is it's only for... Oh, this is Pacific Crest. Yeah, actually, because the theater has three stages. They have the the, the co-op, co what Anne mentioned, and then they have the middle space, which is a smaller theater, about 34 seats. Then they have the larger theater, which is 99 seats. Is that on Venice Boulevard? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. So yeah, they have three theaters Yeah, there. they're a great company, and it's, yeah. it's uh, people get to really you know, hone their craft there. So how did you become familiar with Beverly Hills? <laughs> because I love that. <laughs> Well, um, funny because, you know, I mean, I come from England, so it's like Beverly Hills, oh, you know. <laughs> I know, was oh, it like that? Yeah, I thought, yeah. come to Beverly Hills, stand on the street <laughs> corner and get discovered. But that didn't happen. Get um, discovered? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> flash, or know. see movie stars is what yeah, I exactly. yeah. say. Uh, I have actually uh, uh, a friend that is a hairdresser at, uh, in Beverly Hills at one of the salons. At Umberto. Uh, at Umberto, and his name's Aaron, he's fantastic. So and, that's uh, our great, that's a great... Uh, venue here on our streets oh i love yeah and 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 he is and he is just he's really funny he's like he's like the uh the clown there he makes everyone laugh and he's just great he's just so fun to go and when you came here from london did you think you'd land up in beverly hills did you ever think about settling here uh, yeah i mean when i actually came out originally to los angeles i came to visit and my girlfriend was here at the time and i just planned to come out for a couple of months and and didn't go back again for quite a while. Oh, so. is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you talked about Umberto, and this jacket is from uh, Neiman Marcus oh. because it's Johnson Hartig, who's the designer for Libertine. And he also sells on another little shop on Cannon. Which, so, which shop? I can't remember the oh. name or I would have told you. <laughs> 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 but he shows his Libertine line there. Oh, um, wow. So tell us what you, how you were performing in London before you came here. Um, well, I was, you know, was pretty young when I left London, and I was actually doing stunts over there at the time, and I was actually boxing and kickboxing. Oh, you and, were? And I was doing acting. It was a very, <laughs> very busy time. Um, but then I ended up moving full-time to Los Angeles, and uh, this has been, you know, basically my home. You know, you, we mentioned Whitechapel, and to yes. me, Whitechapel was always an art place. It has a great art gallery, and uh, the artists spend a lot of time there. But yours was totally, yours was acting in a way. Acting, yeah, and, and boxing. You know, I actually boxed in um, in Whitechapel at a gym called the Repton Boys Club. It was a famous boxing club. It's been around for like over 100 years. It was very tough. I mean, I was more scared going there than I actually was to get in the ring and fight because the guys because, were so tough. But that's what I was wondering. It's like an immigrant population, right? Yeah, and that's where my, my actually, my dad's grandparents had a sweet shop there. And oh. in Whitechapel, in the heart of Whitechapel, and the famous Cray twins, who are notorious English gangsters, are legendary, you know, they right. used to visit my grand, my great grandparents' store. The sweet shop? The sweet the cray, shop. The Cray, and cray twins, right? The Cray right? twins, Ooh. and the Cray twins loved my great grandparents. And then my grandparents <laughs> then took over the sweet shop, candy store. And so they kind of it continued. Oh, that's you know. so great. Is so, yeah. it still there? No, it closed, no. closed many, many years ago. So the immigrant population was pretty tough because they had to. Jews, Poles, I mean, I mean, India, it was, it was everyone just, was everyone just got along. Right? Everyone got along, yeah. I mean, I didn't live in, I was in Essex, but, you know, we still remember as a kid going there and everyone just got along. Everyone, it was, it was great, you know. That's probably why the artists went there too, because they always go to an area that's like, doesn't have such high rents, and you can start your your business, your work there. Yeah. Were was that area, and what you were talking about, the inspiration for any of your plays? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 my show now, my one man show, which I wrote, is based on growing up in, not in Whitechapel because I was born there, but I didn't live there. I lived in Essex, growing up in the school system there, and is, was it a lot different? Yeah, I think I think Whitechapel was more grittier. You know, whereas yeah. in Essex was a little, it was a little nicer, but it it still got. As a school kid growing up in the eighties, I mean, you, I got bullied. You know, I got bullied every single day. 
So but you tough. were a boxer, no? It wasn't a, that's why I got into boxing, because oh, I was bullied. Oh, I got oh, I got oh, beat oh. up, and then I decided to do martial arts, and then kind of fight So back. you've been in a lot of play, a lot of films. What kind of character do you play? Um, I just shot, actually, a horror <laughs> film. Uh, <laughs> you I, did I, shoot I, a horror film? Just, just, yeah, just, we're still shooting here. We've got a f few days left, but it, I played um, a, the rea reality star director in this film. So you and, weren't a ghost or anything? Uh, I wasn't a ghost, no. <laughs> and I did, uh, I played different roles. I played uh, like a, a car salesman and I played um, um, actually a guy with psychological issues whose father was, turns out to be a mass murderer. And That's stuff. what I would think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah. do, you have a, do you use your accent or do you have to change my, accents? Um, my American accent is the worst. I actually went into, I was telling someone this today, <laughs> I actually went into an audition for an American role which I worked on for three days with a dialect teacher I did my best American accent. I said to her afterwards, do you want me to do my British accent? She said, I thought that was your British accent. I was just going to say. <laughs> so, yeah, it wasn't very successful. Um, one, of, one of the um, plays that you, you wrote was about Sam Langford. That's a screenplay. It's yeah, a, it's a screen screenplay. Yeah, Who uh, is that and, and why was it important? Sam Langford, um, growing up, I always heard the name Sam Langford, Sam Langford. He was born uh, about in 1886 and they basically said he was the greatest ever fighter never to fight for the title he was oh, never to fight he was <coughs> uh, he was a black guy from Nova Scotia Canada he was five foot seven he was like put Muhammad Ali and um, Louis Armstrong together and that's Sam Langford he was had a humor he had a smile and he hit so hard. They said when they hit you, he, when he hit you, it was like taking ether. He just went to sleep. Really? Um, but at the time, Jack Johnson was world heavyweight champion, and Jack Johnson would not fight Sam because he knew. He was Sam, afraid. He, he was afraid. Yeah, even Jack Dempsey quotes. There's a quote from Jack Dempsey that says, "The hell I fear no man. I would not fight Sam Langford." And this is when Sam was 40 years old, and Sam actually wow. fought and won the Mexican heavyweight title blind. He went blind at the end of his career. And uh, wow. the guy was incredible. So I wrote the screenplay based, based on the book by a great writer called Clay Moyle. Oh, and he optioned right. the book and I wrote the screenplay. So, so what yeah, are we waiting for? Waiting for someone to Are you going to be acting in it? it? Yeah, I'd like to have a little part, but I don't think I'm right for Sam. But yeah. <laughs> No, you have to cast Sam. Did you yeah. write for, with someone in mind? When I, you were doing I, that? I do have someone in mind, but well, we, and someone I know is trying to get the script to him, so we'll see. But, um, it's, you know, it's a big budget film, so it will take some time. But there is someone interested, but we're just waiting for a contract. It's, it's a wonderful, it's, it's... He, was he, did he live in London? No, Sam... Oh, he came from Nova Scotia or he didn't come? Sam, Sam came from Nova Scotia and actually at the age of 15 walked to Boston. Oh, it is? Yeah, and he just was, every time, when I read the book, I just got goosebumps. I just somehow... You know, a Jewish kid from London writing a story about a black guy from Nova Scotia fighting out of Boston. But I just had the, this guy, just, I love this guy. I just wish I could give him a hug. Just you feel his presence through the book. But now we know? have to add the Armenians too in Boston because your husband, John Flynn, just did a play that Leslie Ivajan wrote. And it's yeah. about persecution. And tell us a little bit about John. Oh, well. The what great was, actor, John. Yeah, right. who's the, he's the d artistic director of Rogue Machine Theater. It's fantastic. Yeah, and um, they were going to produce Leslie's play, which was called A Hundred Aprils. Uh, and of course, it deals with the immediate and the generational um, repercussions of the Holocaust. Of the Armenian genocide. genocide right. Yeah. And, um, and John was, you know, the artistic director, and he was there for auditions. And, you know, sometimes he had to read with the actors, reading for some of the parts. And Leslie, who was the playwright, thought he would be great for this part, which is a, the part, really. Yes, because he's on the stage the whole time in, yeah. in a bed, right? Yeah. So Leslie Ivajan, who is a great playwright from New York, she lives in New York, uh, is, was also in the play. Yeah. So I think she wanted to play opposite John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have you ever acted with him? No, he's directed me twice. Uh, and there was maybe 10, 15 years between them. And I think it'll be another <laughs> Oh, is that right? <laughs> between the plays? <laughs> yeah. And it might be that, that long again. 
So, so Steve, you talked about uh, um, performing in The Caretaker, which was an award-winning play. Who directed you? And tell us a little bit about that performance. Well, funny, the, the Caretaker was at the Zephyr, where I'm performing my play now. That was 14 years ago. And oh. just, it was actually Bob Mandon, Robert Mandon, that used to be in the show. Oh, so yeah, 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 he yeah. starred in that show. And we had limited audience members, because it was, you know, just, it was hard to get audience. And Bob actually went on to win Best Actor at the, uh, at the um, uh, I think it was the LA... LA Critics? LA, oh. One of them, yeah, one LA of the big Critics. ones. He won, and everyone was like, huh? But he was so amazing. This guy would come in to the theatre with his teeth and his smile and look great, and come out of his dressing room 20 minutes, had teeth out, hair messed up, and looked like a homeless guy, which he was supposed to play in the play. And I just, I think it was one of the best... It, it, my, every time on the stage ever, his performance was the best I'd ever seen. It was amazing. It was, I couldn't believe it. And then you wrote this dark comedy called Unleashed. It's a short, is it short? Unleashed is actually written with, it's, no, it's a TV show about oh, the world of, it's about the world of animal rescue. It's about, uh, it's a half hour dark comedy about a woman who's a very successful publicist and she hits a, dog, a serviceman's dog in a crosswalk and has to do community service and an animal rescue group, but no one wants to take her because they hate her because she drove off after the accident. Uh, so one man who's kind of misogynistic, he says, you can come work on my rescue group. And he's, uh, it, he's, he hates her and she hates him. It's basically Ooh. a slow descent into the world of animal rescue and her eyes are open to a whole different world. How do you even cast something like that? Or well, how do you even act well, it's that? Funny it's cause really tough. The, the girl that originally actually wrote the original show her name's Silva Kalejian she's um, oh, Armenian Silva. yeah, yeah Silva, she's Armenian yeah. too yeah. <laughs> so she came to me with a script and we she developed it? it she wrote the original version and then we developed it over the years and then uh, Alison Eastwood uh, Clint's oh, daughter I know Alison too she came on, <laughs> yeah she <laughs> came on board she came on board and uh, is directing it so we're just we're making it ourselves so we're in the process of oh you're in the process now I want to talk about animal rescue when we come back yes. we're going to take a break um, we'll be right back with Steve and with Anne, and we'll talk about Start and uh, UK Underdog. Don't look at me. Your hair's a bit frizzy today. Aww. You should pick that up. <laughs> oh, you're such a dork. Loser. Here, let me help you with that. Oops. <laughs> Every day, kids witness bullying. Oh, look. Your crush is looking at you. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> they want to help, but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you. because no one Teach your kids you. how to be more than a bystander. Visit StopBullying.gov. Body language can tell you all sorts of things. Like someone is having a stroke. Know the sudden signs. Learn fast. Face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty. Time to call 911 and get them to a hospital immediately. Learn the body language and spot a stroke fast. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome back to the Beverly Hills View. We're here with director Ann Bronston and actor activist Steve Spiro. So let's talk about UK Underdog. We have the uh, poster and you're wearing your <laughs> shirt. <laughs> Keep your shirt open so we can see it. Tell us a little bit about this, Steve. Um, so this show started off as a 20 minute class exercise back in the late 90s in an acting class. And the teacher told us to write a short piece about something that happened in our life. So I brought in a 20 minute piece and I just developed it over the years and workshopped it, went back to the drawing board, rewrote, rewrote, rewrote. And a couple of years ago, I decided it was ready-ish. And I did a reading and Anne was at the reading and I asked Anne if she'd be interested. And we sat down and said, look, let's give it a week. If we don't get along, we'll just part ways. And we've been working for the last So was that through Rogue Machine? Or it was through, through Pacific, Pacific Resident Theatre, yes. Pacific, <clears throat> Pacific, yes. Pacific, Pacific Resident, Resident Theatre, yes. So it is autobiographical. It's autobiographical, it's uh, about 80 minutes long, and it's about growing up as a bullied teenager at school and and what happened as, as, a, as an aftermath. So what drew you to this project? Were you on the road with him all the way along or just no, toward the end? No, just a year ago, really. A year and a half, yeah. yeah. A year and a half ago. Um, you know, who's just another guy who asked me to, you know, 
work on a piece that he was wanted to do, and I was like, sure. And um, it's been an amazing, uh, inspiring journey. Did you have to research it, or did you know people who were in the same position that he was? Bullies no. or bullied oh, kids? Oh, yes, yes, that I, I did. <coughs> Uh, Steve, you wrote it because you know that subject better than anyone, but why did you need Anne to direct you? Because uh, I, needed, <clears throat> I needed someone to just take the script and cut away the fat and trim it down. But as a writer, was it okay with you that somebody does that? Yeah, but this is the thing. Was, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it, well, it is difficult because it's very personal. It's killing babies. You're killing your baby. You've write, written something. I know, and, and Anne come up. Yeah, oh, she, she, I mean, yeah. And Anne took a lot of stuff out, and but she was 100% right. Because you, at the end of the day, you've got to go, is this, is this serving the story? And if it's not, it has oh, to go. Oh, is it serving the story and yeah. moving you along? Yeah. But how long are you on stage? Uh, 84 minutes. 84. And I play about 18 different characters. Oh, I see. And what are the characters? I play the bully. Uh, you play the bully who bullies the, you, right? Yeah, and his two friends. I play my dad. I play my nana, my grandma. I pay, play uh, my my uh, drama school teacher. Your father. I play uh, my father. I play the lawyer. I play my uh, my, my best friend in it called Urch, uh, who was at, actually at the opening last night of the show. He came over from England to see it. Oh, well, that's great. And uh, I play a bunch of different characters. So how do you get, you, you're moving from character to character yes. while you're telling the story, yes. right? So how do you change your character? Uh, just from voice and uh, physical position, you know, body, body position, and uh, through, through um, just, um, just effort. Costumes? <laughs> do you no change? costume. There's no, no costume. costume. There's changing. no costume and there's no set. There's just one store. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And then what about the lighting? Is there any music? We have light, lighting? yeah. We have some lighting and we have music and um, and we have a projector that wasn't working for opening, so we did it without the. We have about four images. Um, what are the images? The you? images are um, we have the British flag and the American flag, uh -huh. and then we have a big cabinet. And then the last image, I'm not going to say because it will give it away the ending. It's a kind of a twist to the end. But so, so this is really interesting. What if something like that happens on opening night? You don't have what you're supposed to be talking about. It, it well, happens. Uh, uh, you know, does well, the history of take theater. Charge? What do you do? Well, well what, actually, I apologize. But it also happened last year when we were doing it at PRT. As a workshop. As a workshop. The last performance, uh, the stage manager was in an accident and couldn't come. So that means we didn't, not only did we not have the projections, we didn't have the light or the sound, which is a huge part of the show. Right. And what do you do? Steve goes up there and he does it. You know, if there's a sound cue that he needs, he, he says, you know, dishwasher or something like that. And that's your sound does, cue? Yeah. Well, no, no, no. I mean, that's, your, that's what you do and then yeah. it comes Pointed, on? Yeah. Which no, is no, what no. It doesn't go. I, he, he, it's <coughs> because we didn't have many sounds. I mean, I think I did two things up in the booth. But if there was a dishwasher sound, you say dishwasher. I'd say it. And yeah. I'd, so I'd, 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 I'd imagine the dishwasher? Yeah, I'd point up to let people know that would have been a sound cue. cue. Yeah. I see. Because my mom in the play is uh, uh, kitchen noises. Oh, I see. So, yes. It's just sound effect. And and what did you have to do last night? <laughs> last night was, everything was okay apart from the uh, the projector. So I just actually nothing. We just carried it. We it actually worked. We just did, yeah. I mean it does. And and so did the last show. I mean people came up to you the last year when we didn't have any of the sounds. And people said that was so great. You know because he creates so much. I mean you know we've got one man on stage with a stool doing 15 different oh, characters. it's 15. Or whatever, what did you say? I think it's 18. We count. 18, 18, yeah, 18 what, yeah. 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 So, um, as yeah. a director, did you cast this play? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she fired me. I know. <laughs> She's my <laughs> understudy. <laughs> did she find you yeah, for she, this play? She fired know. me. No, no, but it's interesting because sometimes <laughs> when I'm directing and I'm thinking often, you know, okay, what's the moment? I need to see, and sometimes I would forget that it's just one person, and I would be like, so Steve, when your father says this, I want you to do, you know, I want you to step forward, and I'm like, oh wait, you are your father. Oh, you can't do that. So but the characters are so real. 
that I start thinking that I've which they're means, actually there. Which means either I'm a good actor or Anne has serious <laughs> issues. <laughs> or bad. Could she cast anyone else in this role? Could anyone else play this part? Yeah, if I can do it, anyone can, but it just takes you got to learn. Just knowing got to learn 84 minutes of dialogue. So, so, <laughs> 40 minutes. so, tell us a little bit about. Actually, you talk about this like the family and your friends and all that. How do they come together, and how does it affect UK underdog? Well, basically, without giving too much away, the story is about which is true. I got bullied at school, and then I took up martial arts, and then something happened where I got into a bad fight on the street and I beat the guy up badly. So do you talk about this all? That's all in the show and then as a consequence of that what happens next. And then Where your life goes? Yeah. Yeah and, and then um, you know the, the character of my best friend in it he's part of his, his journey all the journeys intertwine somehow they all come together. Like your parents, your grandparents, parents, yeah, your friends. Yeah and it's all, yeah they all take, take a parallel yeah. So, so my <coughs> friend photographer Dimitri Halkaitis started a non-profit group he lives in Palm Springs but he's been his brother is here in Beverly Hills he's a hairdresser in Beverly Hills and they've spent most of their life in Beverly Hills um, and he started a group called Boo to Bullying. Love it. And they go to schools Love and it. they talk about the problem. What do you talk about when you do that as far as bullying goes? Well, it's funny because what we've done is we, I raised the money through my rescue group up front to produce the play. That's Start. Yeah, so through Start we got some wonderful, my friend Ellen Leventhal who lives in Beverly Hills. She lives here, right? She, she put some money in and my other great friend Linda Rasnick put some money in and they, you know, we raised some money to produce this show, so all proceeds uh -huh. from ticket sales, we've teamed up with about 14 different animal rescue and anti-bullying groups. For every ticket they sell to the show to their fan base, they get 75%, which is $20 of every $25 oh, ticket sale. So, so I, my goal is to make everyone money, all these great rescue groups that we've teamed up with. We've teamed up with you know, uh, um, uh, uh, groups like um, uh, PCRM, Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine, Wildlife SOS that help uh -huh really endangered you know rhinos and elephants some great oh. great groups and we've even teamed up with um some anti-bullying groups yeah buddha bullying would be great they'd, they'd be go great to for high this, yeah. schools and, and maybe yeah. do you perform it could you perform it, it at a great. high school venue or a college venue there's a little swearing in there but that could be toned down but yeah it's uh, but it's fine i mean kids listen they, yeah. they, they Cause, <laughs> because you don't need a set don't need to sit, no. I mean, it makes it pretty simple, yeah. right? We have, I mean, we do have a, like a backdrop. I think I can go behind, yeah. but it's so simple. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. And we've had a great team like Lucy, my publicist, has been fantastic. Ginger, the, Lucy uh, my Pollock. producer, Lucy yeah, Pollock, she's and great. Ginger Perkins has been amazing. And, and Anne, and just uh, Daniel, and the Daniel. sound guy, everyone's just yeah. been great. Michael, Woody. Michael, yeah, it's been a great little team. But I, I think that the idea that it, involves everyone and that it sends a message. What message did you want to send the, with writing this play? The message was really simple from the beginning is basically you get knocked down and you get back up. You know, and that, that was it. You and just it keep getting up, you? You keep going, keep, keep just keep pushing forward, yeah. And and <clears throat> have many people come up to me after the show and just say they it really inspired them because they were bullied or they were made fun of and it just gave let them they said it made them feel good that they're not alone. Because it is that you're not alone and that there's something you can do about it and you don't have to fall for what's happening to you. Yeah, yeah. It's very difficult. It's easy to say, right? Yeah. But you yeah. you also taught... Um, Boxing, yeah. I yeah, did you? Yeah, where, yeah. Do you where do you teach? I teach now at a gym called In Training in Beverly, uh, Beverly Boulevard and uh, uh, between La Brea and Fairfax. And there's a weight training gym and a boxing gym, so I teach There's there. a boxing gym. What do you, yeah. How do you teach somebody to box? Um tend to put their hands up and yeah. I hit them as hard as I can and <laughs> make sure they block it. Is it's just the movement, just the, it's the, you know, the sweet science. I you know, know but yeah. is, it, is it like athletic? Do you have to do something before no, you start it's, taking it's very, your classes? It's, it's very, very technical. You know, it's oh, very more technical. technical. It's very, all, all great, all sports are technical. You know, it's, it's, there's an there's a art to everything, you know. And? No, uh, it's, it's athletic though. And, I mean, and boxed. You did? I, I did, I had a wonderful little few years in Florida um, 
learning to box, and yeah, she's I did. Good. I, did. I am good. A good right. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> but have but you taken classes from him? No, not from me. No, I, I just want to fight him. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen of Beverly Hills, we're going to say goodbye to Anne and to Steve. Thank you so, Thank much, you so much for much. coming, and good luck with UK Underdog. And say hello to John I for will. me. And thanks for being with us. And all of you, thank you very much for watching the Beverly Hills View, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>